we're going to go ahead and prepare to uh, for our second part and have a, a conversation and talk a bit about solutions. And I uh, want to introduce you all to, to two uh, you know, really innovative companies uh, here at, at Vive and, and want to uh, continue that conversation, talk a bit about how they got started, uh, let, you, uh, let them introduce their business and, 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 and how they fit into the conversation. And then we really are hoping to, to get into the conversation about where there is the opportunity, right? So, so in businesses like theirs, how would they work with government and state and community organizations to bring the right kind of solutions um, um, to, together. So to my left, we have Nate Pelzer, a founding CEO of um, uh, Clinify Health. And to my right, we have Derek Miles, founder and CEO of Core Med. And I'd like to start with Nate uh, to introduce himself, talk a bit about Clinify, uh, what Clinify does, and, uh, and then how he got started, and then we'll, we'll go to Sure. That. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so Nathan Pelzer, co-founder and CEO of Clinify Health, and we work with payers and providers, specifically federally qualified health centers, mm -hmm. uh, and support the transition to value-based models of care delivery and reimbursement uh, from a culturally competent angle, meaning that we incorporate social determinants of health into the, clin the clinical decision-making uh, for physicians and care teams. And, uh, really how I got started, I, I was at a former startup uh, that worked in value-based care, uh, specifically with Medicare Advantage populations, and really when you looked at the numbers, you saw that Medicaid is the fastest growing uh, line of business when it comes to healthcare. Uh, the spend is growing disproportionately, the outcomes are worse, uh, and the opportunity to actually reduce uh, MLRs or, or medical loss ratios uh, at the plan level can really be streamlined through operational efficiencies in addition to clinical intervention. So we saw that you know, Medicaid is a real opportunity. Um, it, it, when it comes to value-based care, it's inherently a capitated model. You know, states have budget line items. CMS fills in some of the gap uh, at the federal level for, for Medicaid patients. Uh, so if you can start to align some of these stakeholder interests, you can really change outcomes while uh, driving economics to these you know, providers that are in underserved communities, plans have better quality outcomes, uh, and we aim to create this flywheel effect. Uh, so that's, that's really what, what drives us, and our thesis is that it's gonna continue to be pushed at the state level for those states that are progressive in Medicare, or Medicaid uh, value-based care. Awesome, awesome. Derek? Thanks again. Uh, Derek Miles, founder and CEO of CoreMed. Uh, and one sentence, CoreMed is an end-to-end -end, uh, healthcare and concierge wellness business. So, so think of relationships, instead of just being a concierge medicine company where you just have a relationship with the physician, think concierge healthcare end to end. We have relationships with the physicians, nurses, pharmacies, laboratories. Uh, we're actually in conversations now with dentists and chiropractors, chiropractors. But the way we got started many, many years ago, back in 2018, we actually were like one of the first companies to bring like a Uber model to delivery of prescriptions. And, um, we got pretty good at that. We got really lucky. A big company called McKesson moved their, nation, their national headquarters from San Francisco to Dallas, and they heard about what we were doing, and they were able to introduce us to thousands of pharmacies across the country. Uh, another thing that we learned pretty quickly was how to make money off of every delivery. You hear about a, a number of uh, crowdsourced delivery companies, and they don't make money, right? Almost like every month you're on CNBC, and some crowd, crowdsourced company uh, produces their numbers and, and they're continuing to lose money. So we figured that out pretty quickly and uh, what we did that was different is that we put our money into marketing and once we started marketing our company we got on the radar of you know, Google and Microsoft and AT&T and all of them invested in our platform and then we started to learn uh, how to to scale our company like the, the companies with a trillion dollar market cap so what they do is they take advantage of what's current in the marketplace so through conversations with, with Google, they, they asked us, hey, can you guys deliver like IV vitamin infu um, infusions? And we said, we never did it before, I think we can. And then Microsoft said, hey, can you guys deliver vaccines? Again, we never did it before, but I think we can. And Amazon said, hey, can you guys deliver monoclonal antibodies? And same conversation, and, and last year, monoclonal antibodies, we made more money from monoclonal antibodies in a month than the entire 12 months of delivering prescriptions. 
So just to give you a little bit more background with me, I'm a former healthcare executive, spent about 15 years in some of the nation's largest academic medical centers. Here in the state of Florida, I uh, cut my teeth at Shands at the University of Florida once I finished graduate school. Became CEO at the age of 31, but by the time I turned 37, 38, I realized that healthcare was just moving a little too slow for my innovative juices, and I, dis and I decided to become an entrepreneur. Uh, similar to the young man to my left, I, I started a couple companies that were uh, colossal failures, but I learned from those colossal failures to get to where we are today with Cormit. Awesome, awesome. What, what I'd like to ask you both, and you both can you know, take, a, take a shot at answering, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, you know, really hard and complex issues um, and issues about, uh, you know, how systems can and cannot be uh, connected, how, how um, data can and cannot be used. Um, when in your respective businesses, how do you see what you're doing as uh, a potential solution to address some of those challenges and problems that we face uh, in connecting people, the right kinds of people in the right moments? Uh, and using a way in which using technology in a way that that uh, advances not only the business side but mm -hmm. but really helps meet patient outcomes and address immediate needs of people. Yeah, I'll take a first cut at that. Sure. Um, you know, Joe, I think the operative word is using technology. Right. A lot of times we think that technology is the solution. Um, mm -hmm. We incorporate technology that drives the insights for our providers for the payers, but we also look at Who's, who's getting that data, where in the sort of value chain and intervention opportunity do we have the most impact? Um, and those are the people we try to target specific data insights to. Um, when it comes to the challenges around it, you know, uh, they're, they're endless, and I think we all know them, right? EHRs are great. Um, I, I think they've modernized healthcare in the last 10 years by digitizing a lot of the things that formerly were paper-based and not really seen, but each EHR, uh, and we integrate into every EHR that we work with uh, at each individual clinic site, they're challenging to integrate with, they're challenging to get the data extracted, they're challenging to normalize that data, and they're challenging to then run that data and show that data to uh, folks that are outside of a specific provider group, right? So there's a lot of regulatory compliance and technology barriers that we have to overcome. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, you know interoperability rules that are making that a little bit easier. They're still not to the standard that a lot of underserved communities need. Right? Fire is great, but uh, a lot of the EHRs that are used by federally qualified health centers aren't on fire standard. They're on uh, still HL7. So overcoming those barriers is is the first challenge, and then being able to get the right data to the right person without over inundating them with with you know useless data, for lack of a better term, uh, so that they can then provide an intervention, but then measuring what is that intervention and how can we optimize the, the outcome from that intervention over time at scale, I, I think is critical. Um, so we're a long ways from it, uh, you know, as an industry, but I think it's, it's, it's not a 15%, 20% change overnight. It's an incremental 1%, 2 3% change uh, with each piece of that stakeholder value chain. And as we move further and further towards interoperability, data sharing, uh, I think we're going to start to see more and more outcomes tied to specific interventions that are measurable and, and scalable. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Yeah, so just taking a deeper dive into our technology, it allows a patient or a customer to make one call and it does it all. So say for instance, you know, with a partnership with physicians, if you need to get in contact and have a conversation with a, you know, a physician, physician for a telehealth visit, you call the same number. If you need to get your prescriptions delivered, you call the same number. If you need to get your teeth cleaned, you call the same number. So what our tech actually does um, through an integration with Stripe, I think is one of the major benefits of what we have today, is that our partners get paid same day for the service that they provide. Typically providers can, it can take up to 30, 40, 60 days to get, provide on, to get paid on some services, but through our partnership with Stripe, once they go into our app and they move that little arrow to the right, which stated they completed a particular task for us, they get paid immediately. Um, and that's a game changer. Uh, so mm -hmm. any physician, any pharmacy, nurse, dentist, once we've pitched our platform, they've signed up. But the beautiful thing about it, what we also learned, is that there have been physicians making house calls for 100 years or nurses going to homes, right? But what we found out is that they did not have the tech 
behind it. So we have the tech that they need now that can communicate with their patients and our customers in real time like it was an Uber or Lyft, but it's for, for healthcare now. And, and with the tech, what, is there a, a, a learning curve? Has it been easy adaptation? Um, or what are some of the barriers with, with, with deploying that tech? Well, I think the tech is easy. Uh, we've been using it since 2018. Uh, we've had drive, we have you know, thousands of drivers that um, we put together videos, but you know, it's the same experience as if you had Uber or Lyft. We, we don't require our customers to download an app you know, like, because they may not use that app a lot. So I use the Lyft app maybe once a month. So it's no need mm -hmm. for us to, to give you an app that you're going to use like once a month. So we use SMS technology. So once uh, you order an item from us, instead of you downloading the app, you get an SMS text message and it gives you a link. And you click on that link and you can see everything in real time. You know, the nurse is going to be there in 15 minutes or at the end, how do you rate this particular service? Again, it's the Uberization for healthcare, but we're doing on the concierge side. Uh, I'll tell you a story. So when I was a healthcare executive, I, I did have a concierge physician, and uh, I really liked the experience. So, and I would say the antithesis to seven-minute medicine is core med. When I was when I would go see a regular physician, you're in there, you see them what seven to fifteen minutes, and you're out of there, right? Um, then you have a prescription. You go to CVS or Walgreens. Mm -hmm. Good luck if they know your name. Totally different experience with my concierge physician. He, he spent an hour with me and really got to know who I am and tried to uh, find out about my parents and any type of history within our family. I really appreciated that. Then I thought to myself, I'm like, hey, instead of me going to CVS or Walgreens, I may go to an independent pharmacy. Am I going to get the same experience? And I went to an independent pharmacy right around the corner, and guess what? The experience was the same. The pharmacists behind the counter tried to get to know me and provided a higher end of service. Most people don't know this, is that you know 30% of the pharmacies around the country are independent, and they are in network because the lion's share of independent pharmacies um, pr provide you know, almost like a concierge medicine. So if you mm -hmm. go to CVS or Walgreens, if you need something specific, they can't do it, but all they can do is you know, add flavor. Anybody mm -hmm. can do that. But if you need a, a, a medicine that, to, that needs to be Created at the pharmacy, independent mm -hmm. pharmacies do that on Unique, site. Uh, something that's uniquely compounded. Yeah, right compounding. Yeah. Okay. So you, you nailed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So independent pharmacies do compounding, where CVS and Walgreens don't. So all your independent pharmacies are already in network, but most people don't even know it. Mm -hmm. So they're giving up that experience to have concierge for just what we call, you know, seven-minute medicine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the. Um, more details into our technology that gives us a competitive advantage. And then we were able to create a regional office here in, in Miami Beach, which gave us access to Brazil and Israel, Australia, uh, Italy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so with that, um, it, and, 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 and it's great to be able to take advantage of not only the technology, but its adaptation. You mentioned something, Nate, that, uh, that resonated with me is that uh, you know, you have community organizations, community health centers, FQACs, that could still be on, an, um, not necessarily antiquated, but aging technology. Um, what, you know, how, how do you get them to adapt? How do you get them to, to recognize the, the change and kind of move in that direction um, uh, or in the direction that, that the te technology is, is moving? Yeah, echoing what I said before, it, the technology is a tool but mm -hmm. for us, a main focus is on change management, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't change clinical workflows, if you don't change staffing models, if you don't change the data that you're looking at to decide what interventions you're using, uh, you know, technology doesn't really do much. So mm -hmm. we, we, we have in each of our practices a dedicated relationship manager, and sometimes we'll hire you know, clinical staff to support the providers in, in the organizations because use of the tool through people on our team or through their own teams individually or independently um, is critical to actually driving outcomes. Otherwise, it's just a great tool, right? It's, and it's cool data and it's analytics and we can do, you know, predictive um, insights into who's gonna, who do we think is gonna go to the ED in the next six months, right? That's, that's easy, it's not a complex algorithm. Um, but what do you do with that? How are you stratifying your patients? Are you looking at 100% of the patient panel? Do you look at 80 to 90% of the highest risk, where do you actually focus your attention? 
Uh, so we have, you know, curriculums that we run through with our clinics around how do you use this data most, most effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and each organization is different. There's no one size fits all. We, we try to develop best practices, but we may run into an organization that does something different that's better. And it's, it's, it's a learning uh, exercise that we're continuing to work through, but that human component of changing the provider's mentality to focus more on population health, changing the care team to understand what they should be doing, um, and, and changing the support model around staffing to try and drive community-based outreach or to try and, dri try and drive care coordination or referrals. That's all dependent on very hyper-local geography idiosyncrasies that, that we try to take into account when we, when we partner with our clinics. So, so you both were brought up a really, uh, something that's really important to, to business and to developing a business, and that's relationships, right? Opportunities in the relationships. Um, and, 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 those, and, those, and drawing from those relationships to create the right kind of opportunities that not only allow you to demonstrate the value of your business, but, but take it to scale. Um, could, could either of you share a little bit more about how, how do you foster the right kind of relationships? Is it, is it luck? Is it just, you know, I'm in the right place at the right time? Is it, um, you know, I, I delivered the right message and we would bring that together? Um, sh can you share a little bit sure. about that? Because I think if you're, if you're in a similar situation as, as a young entrepreneur startup, you know, how do you, how do you say I have this, this, this really good widget? How do I, how do I put, it out, put it out there and make it, make it actionable? Since Nate went last, I'll take this. Okay. Yeah. I would say it's intentionality. So even coming here, you know, even though uh, CoreMed has relationships with Microsoft and uh, Google, but we didn't have a relationship with Google Health yet. So I took it upon myself to utilize the, the Vive app to connect with everyone within Google Health. Um, our relationship with Microsoft, you know, outside of Seattle, their largest headquarters is in DFW. So we were fortunate enough to start building relationships at Microsoft and then after George Floyd situation um, happened, they allocated $50 million to help small businesses. And because that relationship was already there, we were the first one to, to get access to those resources. And I'll tell you a story about a, a gentleman that I, I really wanted mm -hmm. to follow. So I, I did fairly well as a hospital administrator, but then I started reading about this gentleman by the name of Robert Smith and how mm -hmm. much money he was making. And I realized that I was in the wrong business. So, um, I was having dinner one night at an event and um, just ex exchanging pleasantries with this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he asked me where I was from and I was telling him I was born and raised in Tampa Bay, home of the, at that time, 2003 Super Bowl <laughs> champion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But we had to add in Super Bowl champions for 2021. So we won it last year. And we we're kind of giggling back and forth and I asked him where he was from. He says, I'm from Denver, Colorado. And I'm like, man, I've been trying to meet this guy from Denver, Colorado for years, I haven't been, I've been unlucky. I said, you ever heard of Robert Smith? And he looked to the left and he looked to the right, he says, man, he's my best friend, we grew up together. I'm like, no way. <laughs> and he said, I mm -hmm. said, I, I, I really want to meet him. So um, he took some time, he and his family came to our house in, in McKinney, Texas, and we developed a relationship. Mm -hmm. And after we developed a relationship, he called Robert about CoreMed and told Robert what we're doing. And uh, he's, he's allocated three individuals, actually two of his best friends are advisors for us. Mm -hmm. Now I will say that I've never met Robert. Uh, Robert's hard, hard to get to, but we do have access to, um, I will call his, his generals and get, and get mm -hmm. some insight into what he thinks we need to do with the business. So I will say it's intentionality, of, of, of course, uh, there's some luck to it, but there was some strategy behind it as well. Awesome, awesome, yeah. similar story. Yeah, our, our answer is, is pretty simple. You know, we, our North Star is our mission. Um, we, we feel that health is um, not equitably distributed and that there needs to be rebalancing of the scales. And I think every single CEO, administrator, staff, worker uh, at federally qualified health centers and generally in the safety net, they are there because of the mission, right? They could go to an academic med medical center or a large hospital system and make more money, have more resources. Uh, but a lot of them, you know, focus on that because they want to serve their community. They, they are a lot of them from the community um, and, and they, they're passionate about giving back from the healthcare angle. So for us, you know, when we have conversations, when I have conversations with CEOs of federally qual qualified health centers that are our clients or prospective clients, it is truly, you know, just getting them to understand why we're doing what we're doing. and 
nine out of ten times our missions are you know exactly aligned. So mm -hmm. that's that's it, it, it's it's an easy conversation around why we do it, and I think that relationship when you when you keep the mission at the forefront, economics, operations, all of that stuff comes behind it. But that is the thing that kind of drives our ability to you know build those relationships and maintain those relationships and grow those relationships. And 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 you know for for you both. Uh, an example that you gave is that there has to be an intentionality on um, on a buyer and, and other another side, right? So, so to your point about Microsoft and, and their intention to invest in in your business, um, you work with private equity as well, and their intention to invest in in your business, and and in that intentionality uh, to to do that because you have to have access to capital. I mean, mm, yeah. we can have that conversation, pull that sheet back is that one of the biggest challenges for uh, uh, any of our businesses is ac access to capital and the right kind of capital, right? right. So you're not just throwing you really expensive money, but you know, access to capital that does provide you a pathway and opportunity in order to grow and scale your business. Um, can, you, can you talk about how, how valuable that is and where do you need the right kind of investment? Uh, uh, start with Nate this time, if that's sure. right, and, 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 and we can, and then really talk about how that comes together to create not only the, the, the business, the, the scale of the business model, but the culture, right? So that's your true north, that's your vision, that's your mission, but now how does that become you know, replicated and taken to scale and of value to the people that, that invest in you? Yeah, um, you know, healthcare is a very expensive industry to do uh, anything in, really. Um, when you're doing stuff like what we do, which is enterprise level software integrating into an EHR, uh, you know, piping back and forth PHI, incorporating quality measures um, that are you know, held by the NCQA accreditation board, all of that stuff costs money to, to play the game. Um, so I, I think you know, the, the capital component is a prerequisite. Um, which is why you have to tie some economics to what you do, even if it's, it's purely mission-oriented. Uh, we found you know, a lot of our investors early on were a mix between state healthcare policy organizations, social impact venture capital funds, and then healthcare-focused venture capital funds. We, we were fortunate enough to be able to kind of select uh, you know, who we wanted to be in our original syndicate of uh, backers, and we were intentional about finding folks that fit into one of those three buckets because if you're not in one of those three buckets, yes, you can give us capital, but it's really going to be hard to use that capital in a way that satisfies you if you don't understand one of those three missions that, that we drive, which is health equity, driving economics back to underserved communities, and improving care and outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was our intention uh, around capital. And the use of it is then just you know, to play the game uh, and, and scale you know, to, to get over these barriers that are in place with a lot of the, the restrictions and regulations around healthcare, which it's, it's one of the most heavily regulated industries, as we all know, uh, probably second to finance. No. Sure. Yeah, for Corman, we've done it totally different than, than most. Uh, we personally don't think raising money is something that we personally celebrate. Um, mm. Even though one, it's only 1% 1 of startups actually get venture capital money, we still don't see that as a win. The win mm -hmm. for us is liquidity event. It's always been when we put our money in early, back in 2016 to start Cormier, we then launched in 2018, our goal was always liquidity event. So uh, yes, we've raised you know, north of, of a million dollars, but you won't see it anywhere. Um, what we've also avoided was any venture capital funds. So um, primarily, it's just been you know, friends and family. And uh, one of the ways that we started, I would say on second base, is because of my friends were independently wealthy. Right? So mm -hmm. we had a bunch of independently wealthy people put money into Cormet. And then when Microsoft came to us and said, hey, Derek, would you consider a, a zero interest loan over an investment from N12? And I, I said immediately, yes, because we had already had what we call you know, product market fit. And having a partner like Microsoft that gives us an opportunity to uh, grow across the world. So there's only mm -hmm. four companies that have a presence in every country in the world, and Microsoft is one of them. So whether we want to go to Brazil or uh, Mexico, 
I'm not going to say, I was going to mm -hmm. say Russia, but right now Russia is not a popular place to say. We can go to um, Indonesia. Uh, Microsoft has mm -hmm. a, a presence there. And um, we rather pay the loan back, and it gives us much more value. So the one of the things that I would see, and we, we did get a term sheet for like $5 million, but once our attorney looked at the details of it, he's like, man, you, you signed this, they're actually running the company. Um, they may not show it on paper, but they have the ability to say, you know, you have to have 100% on decisions over $100,000. So if you have one person, they wanted a board seat. So if mm -hmm. you have one person on the board seat said, no, Derek, you can't do those things. So we decided that we would not do uh, VC money, and we decided that we would go with uh, Microsoft. So they, they gave us an initial round of funding, and um, we just requested, uh, I think it was an, an eight-figure number, so that we can scale across the world. And those, and those things are important. Those lessons are important to share because, you know, we, we can talk about mission and, and value, um, but understanding the different types of mechanisms by which you can get the right kind of dollars in place to allow you the flexibility to, to, to reach those goals are also important. Um, and so what, what I'd like to kind of conclude with is that, you know, what would you say, you know, the future of not only your business, but the future of, of, of businesses like yours look like um, in the next three years, five years, next year? Mm -hmm. um, and where do you see the, the, the right opportunities to, to deliver value, not only to, you know, um, to your current market, but, but to a new market. Yeah. You know, similar to Nate, we, we do have a mission at CoreMed, and uh, what do I see the futures going is, is based on something that personally impacts me. So just to give you more insight into CoreMed, when people look at the word CoreMed, C-O-U-R, they, some, for some reason, they think courier, but it's not. It, in the middle of the word of encouragement is C-O-U-R. Our goal is to provide an encouraging experience through healthcare because most people don't have an encouraging experience through healthcare, right? Uh, one of the things that was discouraging to me when I was younger, my grandparents used to have to go to nursing homes. I hated going to nursing homes. They smelled bad. So um, post-core med, what I see as a future for, for me is to get involved in aging at home so that my parents who are older don't have to go to a nursing home. We don't have to spend on our resources to get Medicare and Medicaid dollars. There's technology that will allow older people to actually age at home. Mm -hmm. That's where I see uh, the future for, for core med is, and, and me personally. Yeah, for, for Clinify, you know, we're at a point where we're really trying to ensure that the data that we're putting in, the interventions that we're recommending, and the outcomes are, are tying and scalable. So, you know, in underserved communities, diabetes and hypertension are two prevalent conditions, right? But there's a lot to unpack there. Diabetes, are you talking about someone who's pre-diabetic, hyperglycemic, have they had a foot amputated, mm -hmm. uh, do they have neuropathy? There's so many different levels to healthcare that each lever that you can pull on the social, clinical, and behavioral side can have different outcomes. Uh, so we're really trying to refine those algorithms and models that we have uh, running through our, our, our platform. Um, next. From that, I would say we're trying to tie, you know, innovative payment models to that, right? We know capitated payments are starting to move more towards social-based organizations. Uh, how do we actually quantify the impact of involving community-based organizations? They're mm -hmm. talked about, but, you know, when you take someone that's homeless and put them into uh, a shelter, we know that the average cost goes from 100000 down to 25000 Homelessness is very straightforward. There's a lot of other social conditions that you can impact and trying to figure out what is a capitated payment that you could start to look at from a reimbursement standpoint uh, is our next iteration. You know, it's a ways out, but where I could see uh, us going is, you know, having enough data to be a um, sort of a liner at the state level for Medicaid agencies, similar to uh, you know, the way Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are federally regulated private entities. Uh, I think there's a lot of white space for companies like Clinify and others to fill that hole because right now CMS and state Medicaid agencies are largely flying blind, right? They, they have RFPs, uh, they, you know, award bids, but MCOs tend to underperform. They re-award bids, MCOs tend to under, underperform. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to improve that whole sort of value chain, uh, and that's where we kind of want to be as we grow. All right, that's exciting. Uh, I, I want to thank you both, and I have just one more question before we, before we wrap up. And um, that, that question is that, you know, you've had this really great conference over the past couple of days, and 
Uh, and, and we've had conversations, you know, in Miami, San Francisco, what have you, D.C., other places. Uh, when, when you look at healthcare right now, whether it's healthcare technology, service delivery, uh, its utilization, um, can you point to one thing right now that, that you're most excited about that you see out there that, um, that, that you see can be a game changer uh, in, in healthcare, whether it's uh, you know, uh, virtual health, uh, uh, you know, remote, uh, telehealth. Um, is, is there something that you see that, that, that is really exciting in terms of a concept that can eventually be, you know, kind of proved out whether in the business model and or, or another way? Yeah, I'll take a first shot at that. You know, sure. I, I do think telehealth is exciting. Um, I think, you know, what we're learning, if you look under the covers, is that we have to tread a little bit lightly because when you use telehealth exclusively and the physician doesn't have the opportunity to actually see the patient face to face, uh, you can have exacerbation of moderate conditions that become very complex. Um, that being said, I think it provides the opportunity for folks that can't get to the doctor, uh, folks that live in rural areas to get uh, healthcare delivered in a very convenient way. Um, outside of that, I think there's a lot of sort of machine learning type technologies that can take the uh, very manual processes out of some of the specialties that are in healthcare. Um, you know, I think when it comes to um, optometry, the ability to read scans for diabetic patients automatically and determine if they're at risk for neuropathy and other uh, retinal conditions that are indicators of progression of those diseases will really make that system more efficient so that the primary care physician, their team, specialists they work with can move quicker to get ahead of um, you know, conditions becoming worse and people seeking high cost care. Uh, so, so I think those two things, the, the sort of machine learning uh, technologies and telehealth are, are probably what's gonna change the game in the near term. But again, they have to be used appropriately. Great, great. Derek? Well, yeah, I would piggyback. I think telehealth has a place, but I also have to acknowledge that if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, the adoption was like literally nothing, right? So we had a telepharmacy platform for a couple of years and people barely used it. And then when COVID hit, everybody was calling us, hey, how, how can we use this thing? So what I'm excited about is the fact that COVID-19 has kind of give, given healthcare a kick in the butt. So instead of waiting around um, for something to happen like a pandemic, that we have conferences like this, that people are looking for innovation are really gonna move in that direction. The second thing that I'm excited about is the reason why CoreMed came to Miami Beach. We saw here in this area, they were moving way faster than any other area when it comes to concierge healthcare and wellness. Baptist Health, South Florida has already started putting like telehealth apparatuses into new homes and condos. And we saw that, man, we can bolt onto that and provide this Indian concierge and wellness uh, platform. So those are two things that I'm really excited about. This is fantastic. I, I want to thank you both and appreciate um, uh, you both uh, for, for joining us today. Congratulations on your business success you're having. Um, and I, uh, I, I see where both of your businesses, uh, you know, not only align, in, you know, in the future, but on all the difficult conversations that we've had in a few, um, um, in, in the past few days. So um, thank you again and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, Look forward to our, our Q&A. Thank you. All right. My Thank pleasure. You. All right. We'll, we'll, um, we're going to have a, a question and answer for our, 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 um, our panelists that we have here. And uh, we still have our other panelists. And uh, yes, we had a question in the back. Hi, thank you so much for talking about your companies. It's very inspiring. Um, I had a question around the value-based reimbursement and helping organizations transition to that. Um, we, I could hear we talking about social determinants of health a bit. So I wanted to get your thoughts on just the future of value-based reimbursement around capitated models to care for like whole person and social determinants of health. Um, I know we've seen Humana and Oshner do an example of that, where they did a social determinants of health value-based reimbursement. So curious to see, do you foresee that as a trend coming down? And how does technology right, play a role um, as a tool towards that? Yeah. 
Um, I have an answer to that from an HMO standpoint, but I'll let, I'll let, I'll let uh, yeah, no, so. I'm, I'm happy to take a cut at that. So, yeah, I don't think it's a trend. It's, it's going to happen. It has to happen, right? We spend 20% of our GDP on healthcare, uh, you know, double what we spend on defense, almost triple what we spend on education, and it's growing. So it, it is becoming a national, like, crisis. So the only way to really stem that tide is value-based care delivery. Uh, my concern is that value-based care and social determinants of health is becoming like a buzzword, and no one really knows what it means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that technology is going to outpace regulations around it. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, you know, CMS, I think, in 2023 is now adding in a kicker of $30 per visit for physicians providing care to members of an underserved community on Medicare. That's like the first step, right? And that's just saying, okay, you live in an underserved area, we're gonna give you 30 extra dollars. That's so far away from saying, this social determinant equates to this dollar amount. Um, complexity number one. Complexity number two is social determinants of health, um, which I don't really like that term because it's not a determinant of your health, it's more of an impact opportunity from a social mm. aspect. Uh, they, they range from the very standard things that everyone knows, transportation, food insecurity, pharmacological deserts, to you know, very complex, nuanced things. What's the violence in your community and how does that equate to your behavioral health needs? Uh, I'm in Chicago uh, and it's literally block by block, your social determinants will change. And the ability to specify a capitated payment or a value-based payment tied to that is really, really complex. Um, and I don't know that anyone really has a solution for it. You know, we, we don't, we're trying to get there. Uh, so doing it at scale is hard, which is why you see nonprofit and very localized organizations saying, we know this community because we're in this community and these people are my friends, my family members, my church members. But to do it at scale from a like plan perspective, state by state, for CMS to do it at the federal level, level we're, we're quite a ways away from it. But I think we have to continue to move that way, and I think we will, but it's, it's going to be a bit of a slog. Yeah, uh, my response to that is that an experience of having, uh, you know, co-founded and we ran a, a Medicaid managed care HMO. Um, we had about 55,000 members. And one of the things that we, we did, and that business is now kind of spun off, uh, is that, to, to, to Nate's point, we, we didn't really like the term social determinants and that uh, it is about the impact. And we, what, we, what we looked in our data was this whole issue of, of individual agency. Uh, and because we, we, uh, we realized that one of the things that was missing and that we actually tried to model based on our claims, medical loss ratio, all of these, all these, all these endpoints, was how do we take those dollars and actually give the community the agency to then act to change the health and then create a value proposition based on that, that then you can negotiate with, with the state, right? So, and that became a very, a very, you know, it was a very new idea, um, but it also became a very controversial idea around regulation, insurance regulation, you know, this, this notion of paying people to be a part of your plan, all that stuff, and that really isn't the intention. The, inten the idea is that there is so much money that, that, that kind of flows uh, if transportation is a problem, right, how do we pay transportation providers in the community that people trust? If care coordination is a problem, going to do home visits, what have you, how do you pay people in the community to actually do it and support it? And what we modeled out was, you know, a, a financial model that says not only are you creating economic opportunity, so now you're changing the economics in the zip code, right? You're changing it down to the block group level. Right, you can geocode where that change is, and then you're taking part of your PM, PM, you're taking part of you know whatever's in your contract, and, and then you're 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 investing that in the community directly, and then trying to negotiate potential upside that you can then you know uh, share with whether it's an FQHC, whether it's you know somebody that does you know uh, recidivism or reentry programming, right, um, or, or someone that does uh, you know drug treatment and the like. And those became very, very difficult conversations because the, the, uh, the, the usual way of that engagement is through a grant, right? You got to sit on RFP and all these people are competing and all this stuff. And, and that's great. Um, and then, you know, people say, well, we've done, you know, this, we're, we're, we're great value to the community because we've been doing this service for 30 years and, you know, et cetera. But now you have to tie it to a metric. 
and a metric that does tie back either to a contract or some, some kind of value proposition. And those are very difficult conversations to have because um, they're, they're difficult to have with the state government that, that either, you know, uh, uh, negotiate or modifies or, or monitors the contract, because they are contracts with a managed care. But they're also very difficult conversations to have with community organizations and social service organizations that aren't used to that type of language, right? And it's, and it's that type of language related to contracts, value, return, investment in people. Um, and you can train people and invest in them, right? So one project that we had proposed was we had people, we were trying to find people, right? We, we, we learned immediately, hey, people who are on Medicaid, you can't find them doing redetermination because over the 18, 24 month period, they have to move three or more times. Mm. You can't find them. So it isn't the housing that's just a crisis, it's the, it's the issues in their, in their daily lives. But what if we hired people in the community that kept that relationship, right? If you hired and trained young men who are formerly incarcerated to go out and find folks who are formerly incarcerated, they're willing to go and go into places and know places that you're not really either going to go into or, or, or know. How does that look in healthcare? Can you give them a mobile device? Can you give them an iPad? Can you, they can go out. How do you train them to go out and do health risk assessments and complete that close of the gap, whether, whether it's, you know, NCQA or whatever? You can train those people to do that. Now you've created jobs and the like. And I'll finish that to say that the, we ran into the biggest roadblock was the conversation of moving that from a social service kind of service delivery to a business model that then moved resources out of those social service pools into the hands of people, right, where you're creating a lives and livelihoods of folks. And that became um, um, a very, very difficult conversation to, to navigate and continues to be. Incredible. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll ask a question because it turns out there's three entrepreneurs on the panel here. <laughs> um, how would you tie this back if you if you were all in business to what do they say do well by doing good? You have a mission based business and you're looking to build a successful business and you're looking to accomplish your mission and, and thing. How do you assess natural disasters as a business opportunity? That's a great question. Um, I, I gave you experience of uh, working in Harris County, you know, following, you know, um, Harvey and that uh, uh, have a relationship with, with a number of organizations, particularly standalone EDs uh, that were there uh, uh, and, um, and providers that became, um, you know, emergency response centers almost by de facto, right? And, 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 offering up what they knew in terms of the mobility, flexibility, swiftness of technology uh, to uh, not only the first responders, but to those that were you know, trying to execute an emergency management plan. The difficulty then is that you're not in a position where there is an immediate uh, uh, process in place from government side that they can take advantage of that. By that I mean is that you know, uh, and, and respect them very much that this is people do on a day-to-day -day basis. You have a bureaucratic process that is a machine unto itself, right, of generating RFPs and all that stuff and contracts and all that. They're not very nimble and flexible enough in an immediate time and during a disaster and or immediately after a disaster to respond to a business opportunity, right? It's, and, and so, and then and there are so many levers to pull. I think that what we have done, and, 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 I, and, I'll, and I, I know that either of these two gentlemen can do that, is you continue to demonstrate the value and the efficacy in what you're doing and presenting it to them, uh, presenting it to local government, state, federal, and showing them the pathway and trying to communicate that so that they are the right people that are pulling the levers, as, as Dr. Tom said earlier in the previous conversation, way ahead of time. 
and putting that into the, the lexicon, putting that into a process, you know, before the storm happens and learning from that, and there has to be a willingness to do that. Um, and I think that's one of the big, big challenges that we have. Yeah, it, it's, it's outside of my area of expertise, but I'll give it a cut. Um, you know, it's, I agree with Joe, like there has to be a, an emergency response plan in place, right, to execute against. But once you have that from our perspective um, and, and my perspective, you're trying to prevent undue mortality and, um, you know, trying to address the highest risk population. So I think if you have data sets on people and specifically the social components of those data sets, are they in multi-generational households? How many chronic conditions and comorbidities do they have that could re result in a, an acute exacerbation and turn into a mor uh, mortality situation? Then you can start to figure out where do we want to focus our energies because a severe population, uh, acute impactful population level event, uh, you can't really address everything as we've seen. So you have to sort of prioritize it, and I think that's how you can start to use data to inform where you start and where you're trying to end. Um, to Joe's point, I mean, to turn that into a business, I'm not, I'm not sure how you could, you could monetize it because it hopefully is a sort of single event situation, um, but I think you could at least present information to supplant a emergency response plan and help them kind of prioritize where they're gonna focus their energies because you don't want people standing on roofs for days, right? You don't want people um, having heart attacks because they can't get uh, a beta blocker because they have a heart condition. So I, I think you can turn that into an opportunity, but to turn it into a scalable business, I, I'm not sure how you would do it that way. Well, for CoreMed, it's who we are today. It's what we do, right? So um, by having investors like Microsoft and conversations with Amazon and Google, that, that's their platform, right? So Amazon started off as a, a bookstore. Look at them today. Microsoft started off as enterprise software, but look at them today. Google started off as a search engine, but look at them today. So what they've been able to do and what we've learned through those relationships is that you always have to adapt by what's actually going on in the, uh, the marketplace. If there's a national disaster, if it's COVID-19, you, ad you adapt and create a, a platform or solutions so that you can solve that problem and potentially scale it. Uh, if it wasn't for COVID-19, we wouldn't even be an end-to-end -end concierge healthcare and wellness company. It was, co was COVID-19 led to that adaptation and the conversations with companies with trillion dollar market caps that gave us access to their playbook. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think the biggest challenge there is, is uh, the language, right? Is, is having, being able to talk together about the same kinds of, of things, contracts, uh, and, and, and execution and deliverables and um, who owns what, right? So if you're negotiating, you know, uh, supporting where to turn the lights back on or electricity, right? And say, hey, not only you're focusing in the hospital, but, you know, here, here's where this concentration of dialysis centers are. And we can see that, right? We can see uh, uh, that and, 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 and execute that. Um, where do you do, you know, delivery of mobile dialysis and, 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 and work with, you know, uh, federal uh, and state and local, uh, uh, you know, agencies to determine that? I mean, one of the, you know, whether it's Irma, Katrina, or, or Harvey, when people are displaced and they leave, that continuity is broken. And if you're, a, you know, whether you're, you're delivering a baby, you're dealing with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, you know, or... Um, loss of a child and you're grieving or loss of a family member or a patient that's on dialysis or, or, or has a heart condition or a child that's on a nebulizer, uh, you know, and it, that requires a lot of coordination. And how do you get that information into people's hands that can, that can act on it? Um, and not so much that it's about, you know, uh, paying the bill as much as it is, is a shared value. It's a value to the state. It's a value to local government. It's a value to the federal government to reduce that loss of life and that impact on community, right, especially long term. You can't have people come back and, if, you know, if they go somewhere else and they, we saw all these circumstances, they go somewhere else and they've died there. But we're not counting them as an impact of where they came from. Um, and you're waiting on that long, drawn-out process of a death certificate, of, 
identification and all of that. Um, and, and so how do you coordinate those types of activities in a way that, of course, allows a business to, to be a business, but it also is a, a value to the community uh, in terms of immediate response, because we have a lot of information. We have a lot of data and work with a lot of entities, whether it's single room occupancy folks or people who have, you know, a lot of these mobile vans are willing to pick people up and all that kind of stuff. And they have all that type of information. Um, the fastest way to get around and get out. But how do you coordinate that in a way that, that, that is not only monetized, but also shows that shared value? Okay. Oh, got one more. One more question. Right. Um, I know the session was focused on thinking about scale, and obviously, a part of scaling is being able to demonstrate your value, um, your business value. So you mentioned demonstrating the ROI and cost savings. Do you have suggestions for other metrics that may be um, a way to demonstrate value, either on the operation side? or even at the patient level, like stages of change or things like that, just any other mm -hmm. suggestions for um, other evaluation metrics to really demonstrate your value as you think about scaling? I, you want to take a shot? <clears throat> well, we just have, so part of the Google monies that we receive, we have a stand up every Monday at 11 o'clock. And I just hate to say it, but our, our model is revenue over, any, over everything. So for us, is, is revenue, um, you know, and, and a company that is, you know, always, you know, every month being evaluated. You, you look, the revenue number is what's most important for us, and uh, I, I wish it might, might be, was different, but that's just our number. It's, it's revenue for us. And, and um, I can give you some that are return um, uh, from some of the work that we've done is, for example, um, and we see that this is still a challenge. Uh, post-pandemic is uh, is workforce capacity, right? Uh, you know, being able to retain uh, your workforce uh, and take care of those people that that, that human capital uh, and and having invested in them and what's going on in their lives. You know, we don't. You know, the, it, the burnout isn't just a physician burnout or or clinicians burnout or a nurse or or RN or anything like that. I mean, you have uh, people who who make relatively you know, they, they don't make a lot of money. I mean, you're talking about not even a minimum wage of $15, but let's say you're making $30 an hour, $32 an hour, $35 an hour. Um, that's not a lot of money and, and uh, for a lot of people and, and families to manage who are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, interacting with people who are experienced traumatic events on an everyday basis, right? And that means that you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, people who work with, uh, mothers that are, you know, um, not only losing the babies, but families that have lost the mothers, right? So in the past two years, the number of women that have died under the age of 30 in their first year of life, I mean, the first year of, of, of giving birth, has increased almost 40%. And so if you are an HMO, or you're, you're, you're uh, uh, you know, a Cerner or you're one of these large companies, how do you help the organizations that work with them as a return uh, and as a, as a core metric that you can impact that number, right? Because that, that's, that's a huge alarm that if, you know, if, if a mother loses a child, then, you know, God willing, the mother can have another child. But if the mother dies, mm -hmm. you see, and so, that becomes a hard metric, but then how do you negotiate that with, uh, you know, put that into, you know, a contract with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid? How is that a part of your, your Medicaid contract, your managed care contract, your PMPM? PM? You know, who controls that dollar, right? And, and, and that's a real hard conversation. Another metric that we have is how do you strengthen the uh, infrastructure within the community such that you can reduce those social impact determinants, right? Not necessarily determinants of health, but those social impact determinants. Uh, for example, with our HMO, we worked with uh, single room occupancies and we worked with uh, also with a hospital to do something very simple. And that was provide single room occupancies with refrigerators. Why would you think we want to do that? 
Because we saw a metric that a lot of people who were homeless or coming into the ED, who are constantly coming as your frequent flyers, had type 2 diabetes, but they're homeless. And then you have a nurse or a doctor giving them insulin. Well, they can't, you know, they can't keep the insulin cold because they're, you know, they're out in the streets. But if you coordinate that with a single room occupancy or, or, the, or the locations where they go, where you can label it, you can use technology to scan it, right? You, 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 can, you can, you know, know that it's theirs, how much they need, all of that. And you can coordinate that and build that infrastructure in the community. It doesn't cost you anything. But then you run into all these rules of why, why you can't do that, right? Um, and so, but wow. So now you have people who are willing to go out and buy a $100 refrigerator, whatever. You buy 12 of them, $1,200. You drop them off at these single room occupancies. And you use your platform, your population health platform is one of the things we did. And, and now you can see that when they leave that hospital, that discharge plan, and you're going to give them that insulin, they know where to go. And it can be kept. It can be kept cold, and they're not coming into the ED constantly and consistently on an emergency room basis, on an emergency basis. But again, that's an ROI. That isn't necessarily just to the bottom line. But you know, you're you're running an HMO. You're not making a huge margin. It's maybe three percent, three point two, whatever it is, based on your HBR, MLR, your your health benefit ratio, your medical loss ratio. Yeah, you're not racking up. But what you're able to do if your mission driven depends on who you are is make those investments in the community. And then you know where we see them? We see them in our claims. We see them in a you know, decline in, in our frequent flyers, you know, the, the, those, those ED visits. We can see them there and then we can, we can measure them. And I think that what we've been asking and, and, and any one of us up here is how do you get those payers, right, whether it's the federal government or other payers to make those upfront investments where we can then draw the right kind of metrics back to, to the bottom line. Um, and the bottom line includes not only revenue, but also the morbidity and mortality rate. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, thank everybody for, for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, we'd like to thank Vive and, 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 uh, and, and Health for having us and, and Chime. And, uh, you know, the uh, presentations and platform will be up uh, this evening, in my understanding. And then so uh, please reach out to us with any follow-up questions that you may have. Uh, we're excited about this. And uh, thank you all again for coming.